Joe Rapp, uh, Professor Strahan, uh, students, colleagues. Uh, it's great to be here. It's, it's, always great to, it's always great to be out of the Pentagon, even if it's only for, for a few hours. But it's just nice to, it's nice to sort of get away from the city and spend a little time uh, uh, doing, doing something else. Um, I do have slides, but I have no words on my slides, or very few. So I've got some pictures that, I, that at least help me when I think about things, sort of, sort of to display it and, and, and talk about it a little bit. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning, or this afternoon, is answer the task that I was given, which is to talk about the changing character of war. What, you know, what's different about it? How is the joint force changing? What are we doing? What's, uh, so what's new? And the basis for how the joint force, the chairman in particular, how we look at the changing character war is encapsulated in the national military strategy. As you know, that's classified documents, so I'm limited on what I can talk about in specifics here today. But nonetheless, that sort of is our worldview. The 22 assumptions that are the core of it reflect the worldview of the joint force and the joint staff. They're thoroughly vetted, uh, and they sort of have, have, talk about the way that we want to uh, look at the world. And the National Military Strategy is the, is the fundamental operational document that we use to inform the Joint Forces activities. It's the first classified National Military Strategy since the end of the Cold War. And there have been a lot of good National Military Strategies in that intervening period. They were all unclassified, so they were all up and out kind of documents. The current version of the NMS is a down and in document. The old ones were strategic communication tools outside. This one's designed to be a strategic communication tools inside. And the chairman came to the conclusion that we needed to issue a classified NMS because we really lacked a coherent approach to strategy. Uh, we're pursuing policy objectives with a, with a number of numbered war plans. A collection of war plans does not a strategy make. Uh, and so we felt we had to have something that sort of cohered and brought the thinking together uh, for the joint force in order to be able to, to, to execute the demands of policy. So we also have some legal requirements that the chairman's supposed to do in his national military strategy. And sometimes those have been honored, sometimes they haven't. But according to Title 10, the chairman's strategy has got to talk about the strategic environment. It's got to give guidance on contingency planning. It's got to identify assumptions, and I talked about that here in just a minute. It's got to identify opportunities and threats, and it's got to do some other things that are, that are probably less important for us here. Hard to do that in an unclassified document. Uh, the other point is that a classified strategy allows you, to, allows you to give a very clear blueprint about how we want to operate. At least for me, if I can read an opponent's strategy, I feel better informed about what I might do uh, with him. So that's another argument for why we think the national military strategy ought to be classified. But I want to unpack a couple of those ideas, and I'll spend a little bit of time doing that. And I'm not going to hopefully get finished from my remarks pretty quickly. What I would really like to do is take questions from you. And, and I'm sincere when they say that. I'm actually armed with a class roster so that we can adopt the Socratic method, because I am going to use all the allotted time. And uh, I'd prefer to do it with your questions, but I can question you if you'd like. It's just it's probably better if you ask me questions. So the character of war has changed. The nature of war, the basic nature of war hasn't changed, but we think the character of war itself has changed. In fact, it, it, that is a fundamental change, and that actually takes us to, to some of the core thinking about the national military strategy. We would argue that largely since the Second World War, our approach has been regional. It's been regional with a laminate on top of it when necessary, uh, and we need to change that. And we, Here's the first slide. Can I get the first slide, please? So this is the teaser. So it's, many of you have seen this slide in a different form. <laughs> so you, you, you may hold that other image in your minds as you look at it, if you'd like. But nonetheless, I'm going to talk about global integration today and what that means for the joint force and, and some of the principles that are part of that. And there's sort of six things I want to talk about when we talk about, when we talk about global integration. And let's go to the next slide, please. I know it's a little more prosaic, but, but there you go. The strategic environment's changed. Local events are no longer local. A tactical event somewhere can have a strategic effect somewhere else. The world is practically, strategically, for us as we think about it, it is smaller. Until recently, fairly recently, most threats could be handled within a regional context. But we don't think that's possible anymore. 
you're going to have to think strategically. Like I said, an event on one side of the world can have a strategic effect on the other side of the world. The potential adversaries, and I'll talk about them here in just a minute, operate across the seams that are created by our regional approach. So one of the key things, the chairman has three things when we talk about the current nature of our current challenges, the nature of our current challenges, they're transregional. They have effects everywhere. Second, the challenges that we, that we face operate across multiple domains. It's not air, land, sea anymore. It's air, land, sea, it's space, it's cyber, it's all five at once. And so sometimes we may eventually get away from multiple domain, just call it all domain. So we've got to be able to do a better job of, of, of understanding that. And the last aspect of the changing environment, they're multifunctional capabilities. Special operations forces, conventional forces, long-range strike capabilities with other things that can all be integrated and, 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 uh, and put together in a way that makes it very complex for us. So in the national military strategy, we actually identify five priority challenges. The chairman's talked about this in public. We identify those challenges as Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and the condition presented by violent extremist organizations, most significantly today, ISIS. So let me just take a minute to, to talk about those five challenges. Those five challenges are going to change. We, we assess today that those are the five most significant ones. But in, in internal deliberations on the NMS, sometimes we've gotten hung up on the fact that we identify these five as, the, as sort of the framing, uh, framing element of the national military strategy. And that's not actually the, tr the case at all. Uh, we have identified those as the, as the five most significant threats that we face today. Probably 10 years ago, the list would have been different. Doubtless, 10 years from now, it's going to be different yet again. So we shouldn't be bounded by these particular threats. We're going, to be we're going to be driven to consideration of what the most significant threats to us and our interests and those interests of our allies and friends are based by assessments in the intelligence community, not by the fact that we happen to pick five off the, off the blotter and decide those were going to be the foes that we're going to frame against eternally because we don't want to do that. But we think those are the ones that we face today. So the challenge that we have, actually, as we go forward is, and we assemble the threats, assemble a little bit about the transregional flexible or transregional challenging nature of war, we're trying to transform the force. We're trying to transform the force in an era of peacetime, the relative peacetime. We haven't had a strategic defeat. Could I get the next slide, please? So... This is the Tay Bridge, the Firth of Tay Bridge, over the Firth of, uh, in Scotland. In 1879, it was a relatively new bridge, the bridge collapsed as the train was passing over it, one dark one night. 75 people aboard died. Everybody died, the train disappeared. Eventually they were able to rebuild the bridge. But the reason the bridge collapsed, they had not properly engineered the bridge for the, for the sheer wind effect that it was gonna face. I just throw that out as something to, as something to think about. We see that as sort of anal analogous to the current situation. We're in sort of un new territory. We want to be very careful as we calculate the stresses and the effects that we're going to face because change without strategic defeat is hard to accomplish. We are changing. We want to do it without the virtue of having to suffer a strategic defeat. Can I get the next slide, please? So this is the Battle of Marignano, 1515. The end of the Swiss is probably a better way to characterize it. For the prior 200 years, they had dominated the tactical battlefield in Europe with the Swiss square. They were literally unbeaten. Uh, over time, adversaries began to make adjustments to their style of warfare, finally beaten by largely a French force in 1515, and they passed from history as a result of that. But I mean, for the 200 years prior to this, you didn't go to war, in particularly in Central or Southern Europe, unless you had Swiss mercenaries, because they were unde literally undefeated on the battlefield. They were unable to adapt, so they passed from the stage. Next slide, please. So, familiar picture. Everybody knows the story. It was the impetus for us to enter the Second World War. Uh, we would just say that we'd like to change the way the Joint Force operates without having to sink the West Virginia here, as you see, or cause an effect like that. Difficult to do. And, but I'm going to talk about how we, how we might approach that. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, as we look at the intellectual heart, if you will, of the NMS, there are five mission bins. And this is what we think it will last, not necessarily the five particular threats that we've identified now, 
but the enduring part of it is the analytic framework that we have when we think about how we bend, how we, how we separate elements of the joint force, how we talk about it, how we assess risk with the joint force. So the first is we want the force to be able to deter conventional attack. The second thing, and next slide please, we want it to do is we want it to be able to deter WMD and operate in a WMD domain. I'll be a little more explicit. We want the joint force needs the capability to deter, but also to operate pre-nuclear, transnuclear, and post-nuclear and have success in that environment should, be should we be required to do so. The next slide, please. So this is the one actually, and so I told my guys to get me some slides, and I'm not sure where this went in my organization, uh, <laughs> but there you go. I am told these are uh, sheep of some kind competing. But I want to spend a little bit of time on this, bighorn sheep actually. Competition below the level of traditional armed conflict. Most of my time with the chairman is spent considering this because we face a variety of foes, Russia and Ukraine, China and the South and East China Sea, Iran and the Middle East, that operate in the space below the level of traditional armed conflict. And they operate with what, what is a whole of government approach for them. They marshal all, the, all their national effects. They marshal, when necessary, very, very limited kinetic effects. They marshal cyber effects. They operate in the information sphere. They operate economically. They apply diplomatic pressure. They operate completely unconstrained by what we would view as the norms of international order. We have to find a way to come to grips with this. Because even if the force, the joint force between we and our allies can deliver overwhelming overmatch against any foe, unless we can master this element, we're going to come up on the short end. So this is of the five elements or bends, this is one that we think is absolutely, absolutely critical to us. Next slide, please. The next one is our allies and partners. If the chairman were standing here, and perhaps he has stood here, I don't know if he's spoken here yet this year, he would tell you that we view... The, for the joint force, the relationships with our allies and partners as the source of our strength. It is critical. It is critical for us strategically. It is critical for us operationally because of the extended nature of United States power. We're going to have to go somewhere else. We're going to have to overfly someone. We're going to have to get permission to go and land somewhere to conduct activities. These are all critical things that the joint force requires we will have to have an allied partner network in order to do that. Additionally, just from a practical matter, if you consider the, the problem of Russia, I would tell you the one thing the Russians are very concerned about is NATO. They are very concerned about NATO because it presents a significant challenge on their western, northern, and southern flanks. They have no analog to that. Those of you who are familiar with the Warsaw Pact during the Cold War know that it was a shotgun wedding that didn't survive the fall of the Berlin Wall. They have nothing to put up against that. And for all the pain and friction of operating with allies and partners, there is absolutely no alternative, no alternative to that. And so we, we see that very clearly as a core part of the national military strategy and our approach. Next slide. So the last one is respond. The joint force has to be able to respond. You have to be able to respond from either forward bases or forward rotation units, and you have to be able to respond from the continental United States. And you've got to be able to, and you've got to, be able to execute decisive action when you do that. So that's a key. That's a, that, you know, so I've given you five things. I've talked about, WM, I've talked about deter conventional attack, deter WMD, talked a little bit about assuring allies and partners, the criticality of operating below the level of conventional armed conflict. We've talked about the requirement to respond. These are not exclusive areas for the joint force, and we will often, when we consider units and we consider risk and we consider force elements and other things, we'll put them into multiple categories, because some are in multiple categories. For example, some forces that would respond to threats would also be very critical for assuring allies. It, you can see there's a synergistic relationship across all of the five. But this is the intellectual framework for how we plan to talk about the joint force from now on as we consider it. And just I want to double tap. I've, I've, hit, I've hit the criticality of competing below the level of armed conflict. Go to the next slide. I just want to hit allies and partners again. Uh, like I said, often it's an uncomfortable relationship, and we would all identify some perhaps uncomfortable relationships in this picture. But they made it work and pursued and effectively... Uh, conducted a global war against a, a very, to, against a very difficult set of enemies. So we, are, we, we absolutely understand the criticality of the alliance and partnership structure that we have. 
So let me just talk a little bit more as I go into a little bit more detail about how we're actually going to try to implement this change. And I sort of joked with you at the beginning that we're going to talk about global integration, and we are going to, going to talk about global integration. But I want to just uh, hit the next slide, please. Anybody know what this is? This is the Fosbury flop. So Dick Fosbury changed the way the high jump was run by turning it over. Until he did this in 1968, jumper went over chest first. Now everybody in the world goes like this because he had an idea that something could be different, and he applied it. And actually, he won the Olympic. I think he won the gold that year. I don't think he set the world record. But nonetheless, any jumper you see now is going to use the Fosbury flop as you go over. I'm just trying to sink a couple of ideas in before we start talking about the practical nature of global integration and what I mean when I say that. Next slide. Another one far more familiar to those of us in the room is the forward pass in football. St. Louis University, 1906, fundamentally changed the nature of the game. So let me go back to a point I made earlier. What we're trying to do is change how we do things without having the, uh, the, valuable, the valuable prodding of a strategic defeat to tell us that we need to change. Because uh, there's a famous line in a book by a guy named Mark Helprin. The book is Soldier of the Great War, and the quote is, anticipation is the heart of wisdom. We have to anticipate. That is one of the things that we should do. We need to look forward, not only see the challenges that we face today, but where we're going to be three to five to ten years from now and how we position the joint force to answer the requirements of policy in this, in this new world that we're going into. So how are we going to do that? Next slide. My favorite slide of all, global integration. It's how we're going to do it. So what is global integration and how does it work? So it, it sort of brings together many of the things that I've already talked about with you. Everything we do has global impact, so you've got to consider it. You have to move away from regional thinking. Does it mean that the Joint Staff's going to become a general staff? We actually actively argued against that in the, in the recent congressional debate over the, over the NDAA and some, uh, and some other things that, that, uh, that the SASC wanted to take a look at. We don't need any more authorities for the chairman. But what we want to do is we think we have a, a need to present the Secretary of Defense and the President with additional decision space to help them under, understand the interlinked nature of all of these threats. So to that end, we are, we're, we, we're approaching the five challenges that I've identified as a set of problems. And so when we think about, when we think about Russia, we don't say we're going to brief you on a numbered plan. We say we're going to talk about the Russia problem because, there are a, because certainly there are phasing, time, space, logistic, the logistics, and numbered war plan stuff that you've got to do. That's the science of the business. We all, we all know that. But the art part of the business and the part that we really need to, where we think we can improve and be value added is, you have to consider the interrelated effects. You know, a consideration of Russia is not a European consideration. You're going to have to think about the Pacific. You're going to have to think about the Arctic. You're going to have to think about Central Asia. It will be global. You will have to think about space. You will have to think about cyber. You got to tie all those activities together. You cannot do that at the regional combat, combatant commander level. It is not possible. I've been a combatant commander J5. I know of what I speak. It is not possible to do that. You can do some of it. You can't do all of it. And what global integrate, the, the theory of global integration is combatant commands will continue to do the things they do in their regional combatant commands. Functional combatant commanders will do the things that they do. But whereas a regional combatant commander thinks about setting his theater for operations, we set the globe for the Secretary of Defense and for the President to make their decisions. And those decisions are interrelated and they will require activities, as I said, from all the way around, around the world. So in a nutshell, that's global integration. It's, a, it, it's, it's not necessarily anything new. There are a variety of processes, though, that are changing in order to go to that. I've already talked a little bit about the way we bundle approaches to these problems. You're not going to see a single plan now. Instead, you might see seven or eight plans that are all linked together under an overarching master plan for the problem. The master plan gets written by the Joint Staff. That's what we do. That's our value added. And if we can't do that, then we're not value added, and we, we will discontinue the experiment. We believe, we have evidence, though, that it will be successful, that it will make 
make the force as a whole more effective in confronting these problems. So I know I'm joking with a little bit with that slide about global integration, but take a look at the NMS. Read the NMS. Understand the NMS. Because we believe that war is changing. We have an opportunity now to change with it, perhaps to anticipate it. War is going to make the world smaller. It's going to make the, the effects of that war can be more lethal. It's going to operate in space as a matter of course. It's going to operate in cyber as a matter of course. And things that would once be constrained to a particular geographic locality are no longer going to be constrained to that geographic locality. Instead, they're going to operate in other dramatically different places. We have to be able to anticipate that. We have to be able to give best military advice. We have to be able to knit all that together. In a nutshell, when I, when I say global integration, when the chairman says global integration, that's what we're talking about. So that's what we think about the changing character of war. Let me briefly summarize. Yes, it's changing. We got some ideas about how to change, how to adapt, how to do things differently. It won't be easy to do because we're going to have to change some practices that have been with us for a long time, practices that have been set in stone really since the end of the, well, really since, war, since the Second World War, when we had what was essentially a regional approach to problems. We now need a global approach to problems. It doesn't mean there won't be regional issues. That doesn't mean that things will arise that we cannot anticipate, but we want to address those globally whenever we can. That's the unique advantage that we have. Global power projection, the ability to operate across the surface of the globe with our allies and partners. That's the unique advantage that we bring. So that's what we want to maximize as we go forward. And that's how we think we adapt, understand, and master the changing character of war. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, 23 minutes, pretty good. And, uh, and I'd like to do some questions. I'll, I'll answer questions about anything I said, anything I, I, I didn't say. Obviously, we're, we're unclassified and apparently streaming to the entire world. So, uh, so that will, of course, <laughs> con con you know, constrain my answers. But I'm happy to talk about what, whatever is on your mind. Sir. Sir, Commander Nick Kristoff, uh, Seminar 7. Sir, you talk about being able to respond from CONUS. You talk about overwhelming overmatch. You talk about global power projection, which is a unique advantage of ours. You talk about the need to give our uh, political leaders additional de decision space. When I hear all that, I think we can't do any of that because we don't have enough lift. We have the best army in the world, and we can't take it anywhere. We have the best fighting force in the world, and by my understanding and looking at a lot of things and working on an O plan, we can't get there from here. So what is the Joint Staff doing, or, or how is the Joint Staff looking at that and thinking about that problem as we go forward? Sure. Where are you going for your next assignment? <laughs> <laughs> Just see my guy. Get, let me try. I got your last four before you get out of here. Um, <laughs> So to tell you what, that is a great question. And actually, uh, one, of the, one of the largest elements we look at all the time is transcom. The functional combatant commanders, and in particular, U.S. Transportation Command, is probably the most stressed and vulnerable of all the combatant commands. In order to respond to war plans right now, and we put, what we have done is, for a variety of good reasons, we put significant time constraints on ourselves with most of our war plans. And so that stresses the force. Either you have to respond with what you have forward at the location where the crisis occurs. And there's going to be some of that. There's going to be some of that forward, whether it's Korea, whether it's Europe, whether it's a variety of other places. You're going to have some forces forward, but not going to be enough. It might be enough to establish a, some kind of stasis until you can eventually do decisive operations. But you're right. You've got to, you've got to sustain those guys. You've got to get... You've got to get beans, bullets, and band-aids forward. That's got to be carried. It's got to be a, a carried through a transportation network that everyone in this room knows is very exposed and at particularly high risk now, perhaps now more than ever, and we're very much aware of that. So that, that is why, particularly when you consider the element of time, you have to take a look at risk. And so the one thing that we do on the joint staff that is critical, the one thing the chairman does is we identify risk. But let me just talk just a little bit about risk, because I think that'll get to the heart of your, of your question. There's only one guy in the building that owns risk. One guy. It's not the chairman. It's the secretary. So we never say, we never say, hey, Mr. Secretary, this is, in our judgment, this is unacceptable risk. Not our job to say that. We might say this is very, 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 very high risk. 
and we don't see how it can be accomplished. But the, the word unacceptable is not a military word. That's a word that has to come from political leadership. That has to come from the leadership of the United States deciding that we don't want to do this. That's not our judgment to make. We provide facts. We tell them the situation, and we take a look at that. But what we're, what we're, what one of the things that we're trying to do as we look at the problem sets is it does help us think about risk better and get to the issues that you're talking about. You're right. We have, some, we have some plans that are at very high risk because it will be very hard to deploy forces there. And then we assume magically there's never going to be any erosion in the basis of the units that move them forward. You know, if you start with X number uh, transport aircraft, none of them will break. None of them will be shot down. None of them will have bad weather and be forced to divert. None of those things will happen. So very, very much aware of that. But I believe that by adopting a problem set approach, you can sort of, what you do is two things. You can get a better understanding of the risk. And then most importantly, and if the chairman were here, this is what he would say, it allows you to present to civilian leadership the nature of that risk so that they can either say, look, we can't do it. So you've got to change the plan. Or here's a mitigating effect that we're going to apply. We're going to buy more of this, or we're going to do something else different. Or they're going to say, look, you have, thank, thanks, uh, Joint Force. You have accurately characterized the risk. It is our decision to accept the risk. Then we salute and accept the risk. Not a great answer because, you know, there isn't a great answer to your particular question. That's a good question. Sir. I'll learn this eventually. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. So not only do you have global streaming, you have a reporter in, even in the hen house. I'm aware of that. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you uh, a two-fold devil's advocate question. Uh, one is, you know, as you explore this new role for the joint staff, you say you don't need to become the general staff, but you know, how do you, you know, break all these uh, rice bowls and stovepipes without new authorities, without new people, without new, I don't know, insignia, you know, red stripes down the trouser leg. Uh, and the flip side is, as you try to make everything more globally focused and less regionally bound, uh, this is a, Sir Hugh Strachan raised this point earlier, how do you make sure we're not just applying, you know, generic templates on top of specific problems and, you know, losing the regional immersed, you know, concrete detail focus uh, that has actually been sort of a strength uh, of the current system. Sure. So from last summer into the fall, the Joint Staff looked at a at, at, at direction of, of, of uh, leadership within the department. We looked at a variety of possible solutions to, to look at global integration. We examined an idea that would give more authority to the Joint Staff. That is not an idea that is, uh, has any viability within the American political system, within American culture, or within American norms. The American people don't want a general staff. They've been very clear on that since the end of the Second World War. And you know, as many of you are aware, there's a lot of excellent history looking at 45, 46, 47. As the nation looked at what it would mean to have a general staff, we decided not to have one then. We've never found good reason to have one since then. We believe, actually, that everything we need to do is, is, is available to us within current legislation. We don't need anything to begin to do the things that I've described about doing. You know, having authority to, doing, to do something and actually doing it are two different things. These are things that where we have, uh, we have not exercised the full range of capabilities available to the joint staff. But I, which leads me directly to your, to your second question, which is a good one. So how do you avoid homogenization of the process? So even if, you don't, if it's not a general staff, everything's decided in Washington. I would tell you that you know, you've, had a, you've had some powerful personalities stand up here in the, in the combatant commanders. Uh, nothing lessens their authority. And a key point, I know I'm speaking to the choir when I say this, the chairman is not in the chain of command. I'm not in the chain of command. He's just a guy with an opinion, and I'm just a guy with an opinion. Uh, we, he, gets, he gets a good opportunity to hear that, make sure that opinion's heard, but the chain of command runs from the Secretary of Defense to the combatant commanders. That's never going to change. However we organize, however we do different things, the chain of command for, for the application of force in the United States is always going to flow from civilian leadership to the combatant commands. We see absolutely no, no reason why the joint staff would ever get into that mix. But what we think we can do is we can assist the Secretary of Defense in making those decisions that he and the President will have to make that are uniquely theirs to make and are not delegable really to anybody else. And so if we think there's value added in what I'm talking about, we think that's where it is. 
but we don't think there's a need for, for, for some kind of a, a general staff. We don't think there's a need for a general in chief. We explicitly reject that as a matter of fact. We don't think there'll be any erosion or loss of combatant commander authority in what we talk about. Remember, think about this. What we're saying is combatant commanders set the theater. We set the globe for the Secretary of Defense. A combatant commander, while powerful, exerts authority within his theater. The UCOM commander exerts very little authority in the Western Pacific. But somebody's going to have to somebody's going to have to coordinate what happens in the Western Pacific if you consider operations against Russia as an example. You've got to be able to do that. The lowest level person that can do that is the Secretary of Defense. So therefore, perhaps we should investigate mechanisms, procedures, and concepts that will allow him to make those decisions more more effectively, more efficiently, and in real time when necessary. So that's sort of our thinking on that, sir. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Curry, uh, 7R7. <clears throat> We've talked about global integration through the department, but what is being done for global integration across the dime? Because the way things are going right now, it's great that we have you know, the things we're doing internally for us, but <clears throat> if we're not affecting across the dime, we were missing other opportunities to actually achieve the effects we want. So I spent a lot of time talking to my colleagues and partners at State uh, and that begins really with the Secretary of Defense on down. I think you can see in public media that the two secretaries have a close relationship. The, the fact that they have a close relationship drives everything that happens them happens underneath them uh, to move forward. There are other elements to the dime, I realize, aside from aside from the relationship with the Department of the State, but that's probably the actual key one that, that we're discussing now. I would tell you that we recognize that as an issue. We recognize that that is something that we've got to do, particularly for, and let me just cite an example. As we consider uh, operations against ISIS globally, we think that is uniquely an interagency, first an interagency problem, but also a problem that is larger than the United States and requires global partnerships. So what we're trying to do very hard as we work that particular problem is ensure we have a whole of government approach to it that does integrate all the elements of the dime. I'm not gonna tell you that we've always been successful at that because sometimes the Department of Defense seems to pick, pick up an undue part of that share because of the resourcing that the department has, the reach that the department has, just the simple the, the, the global resources that the Department of Defense has that are really unmatched by anybody else. But the long-term solution, it begins with the Secretary of Defense, you're not going to reach through military means alone. Therefore, you have to work very hard to inculcate that as you begin. I would tell you that's part of the NMS. We recognize that. You've got to be able to do it at two levels. You've got to be able to do it within the U.S. interagency, but just as important, you've got to be able to do it with your allies and partners as you move forward. So it's sort of a two-part problem. It is a problem. I don't want to minimize the fact that we're not always very good at that. I would tell you that we recognize that and we'll work very hard to, we'll work very hard to, to get better and more effective at it as we go forward. The most immediate example will be how we do against ISIS. Next question. Sir. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Rick Balustri, Seminar 24. Sir, within the uh, theme of uh, global integration, is the current structure of uh, geographic and functional combatant commands uh, the best organization to address it? And uh, if it is, do you anticipate a greater role for the Joint Staff as an arbitrator between two or more uh, combatant commands? Yeah, let me take the second half of your question first. So the person who arbitrates between two combatant commands there's only one guy that can do that. That's Secretary of Defense. You know, he's the only guy that can do that. So the role of the Joint Staff is to assist the Secretary of Defense in making those decisions when necessary. So that's what we've done in the past. That's what we're going to continue to do in the future. We think we can do it more efficiently, more effectively. So, you know, every couple of years we look at uh, redesigning the map of the world and changing the UCP. Um, a couple of years ago we looked at combining NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, We've looked at combining AFRICOM and UCOM. Uh, we've looked at a, a variety of different things. Uh, right now, we're not contemplating doing that, but five or seven or 10 years from now, I think it's gonna look different than it does now. I think we're gonna start with what we have now, and I think we're gonna, we will uncover, we'll go through a process of discovery with the approach we're undertaking, and that may lead us to some different conclusions down the road. I don't know what those are or what those are going to be, but I think it's possible that you might get to that. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, probably some of you already know this, Russia not, did not always belong to UCOM. For most of the Cold War, Russia was not assigned to a combatant commander. 
is assigned to the chairman. So, you know, there are actually very few things in the world of military planning. Uh, but Russia was, an, was what they call chairman, I think chairman accepted was the language that they used. But Russia was held separately. Um, I, we're not advocating that. I'm just saying that if you look in the past, there have been all kinds of different ways to deal with some of these problems. And, and so, you know, we, we don't have to look far to see that. But I don't think right now we're contemplating any significant changes to the UCP. But as you know, the UCP is signed by the president. So that ultimately is going to be a very high-level policy decision. Next question. Sir. Sir, Monty Montague, Seminar 18. Two of the points that I took away from your talk was the justification for the security classification for the NMS, as well as the focus on global integration. And while those concepts both make sense, that there are two particular holes I'd like to see what you guys have done to address mm -hmm. those. With the security classification, the ability to communicate across the whole of government, as you discussed, as well as to our allies and partners, how do we address that within the confines of a classified NMS? And with global integration, if every problem you consider as potentially having global implications, what does that do in terms of not forcing escalation? Some, it's come, some of the conversation that we had this morning. Can you talk both of those? Sure. Um, there are, I want to say, 15 different versions of the NMS that have been released to most of the allies and partners. So the NMS is out in pretty wide dis distribution with our allies and partners. Because you're right, so if you say that the source of all your strengths are allies and partners, yet you have a strategy you can't share with them, not smart. So I think we've actually got it in pretty wide distribution across. So, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. So the next one is, so everything, well, of course, not everything is global. There are small things that are not going to have global effects. I'm simply citing the high-end problems that are going to have global effects. There are many emerging things that could, that could develop that will not actually impact across the globe. And those things, exords will be cut, forces will flow, people, regional combatant commanders will generally answer those, answer those problems without global effects. But for the larger problems, and you know, somewhere you cross, as you go up that continuum, you shift from purely local to, to global. I don't know, wouldn't pretend to know when, where that's going to be or how that's going to be shaped, but, but, it is, but there is a gradation. But I think, I'm not saying that everything is going to have to actually have global consideration, because we're not going to have the bandwidth to do that. It's just not possible. You know, go, going forward, but I think for the big things, the the the, uh, the potential uh, the potential challenges that do have the ability to reach across the globe, you have to answer in kind, and you have to think in kind. Next question, sir. Sir Mark Reed, seminar eighteen. Just looking to delve a little deeper into your comments on uh, change absent uh, the defeat, uh, the strategic defeat. You know, so are you talking culture change? Are you talking, um, you know, organizational? You know, what are those elements that you see that are going to have the impact of change uh, at, that does not cause us to experience strategic defeat in order to achieve them? Yeah, so I, I think it's a, um, I don't think it's going to change anything at the flying squadron, the infantry battalion, the ship level. We're very good there. We, we, I mean, we're, we're very good at those capabilities. I, if I were going to describe it, I would say it's a, it's a cultural change at the strategic level where we actually think about how we link problems together and how we assess risk against those problems. So I think that's where we would like to drive change. And the, or, like I said, the organizational changes are going to be very minimal because organizational changes are usually unsatisfying at this level when you respond to problems. You've got to drive to cultural changes. Talk to audiences like this. Ensure the NMS is read. Make sure everybody's got a copy of that poster in their room. You know, things like that will actually drive some form of, of cultural change, which is what I think we, I think we want. I'm just sort of thinking out loud. Uh, that would be my, my response to you. But the change to be lasting, I think it's got to be cultural if you want it to last. But look, we don't need to tinker with stuff that works. And look, the vast majority works very, very, very well. We're talking about ways that we can actually improve based on the observation that the challenges that we face are shifting and are not the same challenges that we faced 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Just as they change, so must we change. Better to do it without a stinging defeat to provide that impetus for you to, to do it. That's, that's what leads us to the approach that we've got right now. Sir. Uh, sir, Colonel Santos Dagal. Nepalese Army, Seminar 16. Concerning your 
uh, advocacy of global integration, I have a little bit different thoughts. Uh, because of the changing character of, of war, I personally see not even a regional integration, but local integration is required. And even the concept of allies, coalition, or partners needs to be adjusted uh, to deal uh, the current uh, global challenges. Your comment, please. Sure. So let me just make sure I, because I, I think we may agree, actually. Look, wherever you go, in, let's take the case of Europe. You're probably going to have a regional coalition that, that could confront a Russia situation as a possibility. It's going to be a coalition of, of nations in that locality. There may be nations and interests outside that geographic area that are, that are, that are going to be involved in it. But ultimately, it's got to have a local expression. Wars are fought at some particular place. Elements of that war may be fought somewhere else. But I, I don't think I disagree with what you're saying, that you have to be able to you have to be able to look at the locality itself and you have to assemble either whether it's an alliance structure or coalition of the willing, the coalition of the temporarily willing, I mean, whatever you want to call it, you have to assemble some kind of structure in order to address that problem. I think our position would be wherever possible, you want to seek friends and partners to do that. You want to seek, inter you want to seek international recognition when you do it, whenever you can. We are never going to obviously give up the right to defend ourselves unilaterally when that's a requirement that we, that we have to execute. But given a choice and given time to do it, you would prefer to operate from a coalition or a partnership perspective. So I think I'm not sure, I think I'm actually aligned with what you said. Does that, does that, but please tell me, is that, does that comport with your remarks? Yes, sir, I do agree with you, but my uh, argument was because the character is completely different. Uh, the issue in uh, Kandar or Helmland, you know, within Afghanistan, uh, because of the localized nature, the, the conflict is, uh, character is different. So uh, the same template cannot be borrowed or implemented even in Syria or in the case of Iraq. That is what was my argument. Uh, so uh, that is why yeah. I, I believe that the, uh, because of the character of war, the, uh, the current conflict is completely localized in nature. I think the danger, and you, I think you, you make a very good observation, the danger that you've got to guard against, and we actually talked a little bit about it earlier, you can't homogenize the approach. You can't template a single approach to everywhere because there are uniquely different challenges depending on where you are in the world, and you've got to be keenly sensitive to that. So I, I, think, that's, I think that's wise counsel. I think that's good advice, and I would agree with it. That is a danger that we're going to have to watch against. Next question. Sir. Dr. Kwanel Kazir from Nigeria Nami. Yes, sir, you talk about empower, empowering friends and partners and the relationship between friends and partners as being the source of your strength. However, we, we still have difficulties in environments like mine, countries like mine that are just uh, emerging, procuring equipment and it takes a very difficult process. Like recently, we were able to acquire some 12 ground attack aircraft, but it took us two years to get that process through. And we, we have that difficulty, and sometimes it drives us to go looking for such equipment from other sources, which we are basically just forced to do, not because we want to do, but because we probably have no option, particularly where I have a situation like Boko Haram now going in my country. So, sir, what is the general staff doing to facilitate such processes for us, particularly from countries like ours that have these violent extremist organizations that are now global problems to facilitate and make it easier for us to acquire equipment? The FMS, the Foreign Military Sales and the Foreign Military Finance Program, which I think most of you are probably uh, aware of, is not a particularly supple or easy instrument to use to, uh, I have direct experience of this as the, as the CENTCOM J5 when I worked it within the CENTCOM AOR and we tried to, you know, you tr people try to buy equipment for a variety of reasons. It's some, some ours, some strictly our own bureaucratic approach makes it hard for them to be able to buy that equipment in the past. So I'm keenly aware of the problem that you talk about. I would tell you this, uh, the Secretary of Defense is, would, would accept your logic he thinks we need to get better at this problem. I'm not going to promise to you that things are going to change overnight, 
But I do agree that you make, a, you make a reasonable observation. Sometimes it's very hard to buy equipment from the United States or in partnership with the United States because it's difficult to navigate the web of interlocking U.S. agencies, opinions, and other things that have to happen in order to get that equipment. So often it's late to need. It's outdated. It's not what you wanted when you started to ask for it. And sometimes it can hurt the relationship more than help the relationship. I'm keenly aware of that uh, from per as a practitioner in the past, and from what I see, the secretary is seized by that action now. It's a good criticism. We're going to have to get better at that, or there will be consequences for not getting better at that, and I take your point. Sir. Sir, Bill Donnelly from Seminar 21. I was just curious your thoughts on with this new focus on uh, more of a global integration, a global approach versus regional. How do you see that affecting uh, the distribution of resources? Always been a competition for resources, different AORs having, you know, different re requirements for, for resources. How do you see with this approach that changing that process? Yeah. So over time, if the approach is going to mean anything, not only is it going to inform, it's going to drive allocation of resources. You don't get to that overnight because you don't change posture overnight. But I would tell you over the next couple of years, now, as we adopt a top-down approach to this problem, we're going to look at how forces are postured forward, how they rotate forward, what's kept back, how, how the joint force measures its readiness. Um, all of those things sort of tie in together. And what it does is, if I could, I'll expand on that just, just a little bit, the NMS and another document that, unfortunately, I, I can't talk about, the Joint Military Net Assessment, except to say that it exists, uh, is designed to allow the chairman to have a, in, in coordination with the JCS, the service chiefs, and the COCOMs, to have a unified voice on assessment, how we, ra how we stack up deployed, where our capability gaps are deployed, the readiness of the force, and how that might change how we might increase the readiness of the force by posture decisions that we might make. Not going to happen this year, probably not going to happen next year. It's going to take a couple, three years to drive. But if you have the courage of your convictions, you got to believe that the NMS and probably ultimately the NDS, which is the National Defense Strategy, which as you know is a document written by the, by the, by the Secretary of Defense, that they're just beginning now that's going to have a powerful, a powerful effect on that. So the short answer to your question is, I believe that it's inevitable that at some point we're going to be driven by these documents. Right now, and, and many of you have been practitioners of this, I'm sure, as have I, it's largely a bottom-up process where you argue and squabble in a very unseemly manner sometimes for resources. And, uh, and that's the nature of the business. But if you have an overarching vision, perhaps you can be better at it. You're never, gonna, you're never gonna be able to get people completely to agree on when there's not enough resources to go around. And you don't seek that. What you seek is a universally recognized logical audit trail that led you to that decision. And people buy into that logic, then the squabbles get a little less unseemly. You don't necessarily get, one combatant command may not get what they want, but they understand the rationale for why they didn't get what they want, rather than the fact they just lost an argument, they just lost an argument in the GFM process, the global force management process. Sir. Sir, uh, Jim Trehart, Department of the uh, Army Civilian. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, <clears throat> philosophy of strategic leadership, particularly as it, you might uh, provide guidance to a, a colonel or a GS-15 working on a joint staff who not only has to work with fellow colleagues on the joint staff, but interact with OSD policy, CAPE, combatant commands, and the services, all of which uh, do not report to the chairman, which probably provides some uh, uh, unique challenges. Sure. So the universe of people that, that we talk to, that I and my, my one stars, my two stars, my colonels and lieutenant colonels w that we talk to is we talk up to the Office of Secretary of Defense. Mainly I talk to policy, USD policy, and the, the universe of people that, that work in there. So we talk to them. When coordinated with them, Sometimes we'll talk across the river to the National Security Council staff. Typically, though, it's always going to be in coordination with OSD. We're going to be paired with them when we go across and have that discussion. We talk to state laterally, and we, we have a variety of regional and specialty branches as well as down at you know, lower levels in the state that, that I talk to and that my people talk to all the time. And then inside the joint force itself, there are two big constituencies. There are the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the service chiefs, 
who I see in the tank twice a week, depending on the topic, uh, and the service staffs. And then there are the COCOMs. And, and those are very, very different entities. You know, the, 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 the service chiefs, and as you heard from my biography, I was the Marine Corps QDR guy, which largely consisted of stealing money from other people, you know, and, and just as they were trying to get it from us. So I know the way, I'm very conversant with the way the game is played inside the building. So service staffs, they, they train the force. They take a long-term institutional view of what, what the Army should look like, what the Navy should look like, what the Marine Corps should look like. The COCOMs, on the other hand, I mean, those are guys making payroll, guys and gals making payroll every day. They got to take the force and apply it. And they actually intend to use it, which, is, you know, which has an effect on readiness of the, of the force and the nature of the force is being prepared by them. So look, there's, there's a natural tension there. And so we work with both. Uh, you know, when the chiefs come into the tank to be JCS members, they are in there legally as JCS members. General Milley's not in there as a chief of staff of the Army. He's in there as a JCS member. Same for the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I would tell you from my personal observation, they do a remarkably good job of going in there and being JCS members when they're, you know, when they're talking to the, when they're talking to the, to the chairman on a particularly, on a particularly difficult issue. Uh, but your, your question is really about strategic leadership. And, and I guess the only point I would make and how I'd sum it up is it's really, it's, serv it's your reputation. I mean, that's sort of what carries you. People got to believe that when you tell them something, you know, you're at least not lying to them. You may be wrong, but it's because you don't know all the information because you can't get that back if you lose it. You can never get it back. So your reputation, it's immortal, particularly in the joint force. And so if I, when I talk to my, to my people, that's what I tell them. It's the one thing we got that we can't trade away. People got to believe that when I as the J-5 say, hey, look, this is what I think, then I really think that, and I may be dumb, and that may be, and we can agree that I'm dumb, but what we can't agree on is that I'm being dissembling when I have that conversation with them because you cannot get that back. And as I've looked up, I've seen it, and I'm sure you have too, and as I've looked down, I've seen it as well. So you strive very hard. If that's just the one thing I would counsel anybody that works for me, particularly in this environment, you know, where you, you don't want to, you, you want to build relationships. That's the other thing. You want people to know who you are. So, you know, believe me, I have a lot of terrible problems in the J-5. I don't want to call somebody up, cold call them for the first time and say, hey, you don't know me, but you, you've got a terrible problem. Let me tell you about it. Uh, you know, you'd prefer to have perhaps had a conversation before then. So you try, to, you, you try to build those human bridges because, you know, all the wiring diagrams in the world, it's all about personal relationships, in my opinion. It's all about the people. I can look around. The, when I'm sitting in the tank, I can look around. I can see the people there, around, the human dynamics at play. When the COCOMs are in there, you can see the human dynamics at play. They're the same people. You know, they're, they're people that sit in this, conference, in this room with you, you know, as colonels. And a few years from now, some of you are going to be standing out there doing the same thing. It's human relationships, and that's, that's, that's the most important thing, at least it is for me. Questions? Sir. I'm Kemp's from Seminar 16. So uh, how is the joint staff analyzing the current situation with North Korea? Very carefully. Um, <laughs> so look, what we do, what we do on the joint staff, what the joint force does is we're in the business of giving options to the president. That's what we do. We give him options. We give him decision space. Decisions about North Korea are, those are political decisions. They're not going to be made by anybody in uniform. They're going to be made by, by the president of the United States in, the sec in consultation with the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and other members of his cabinet. What we do is we give the president the maximum range of options possible so that we can further our policy objectives as described to us. That's what we do, and obviously there's not much more I can say about it, except that it does consume a lot of time, as you'd expect right now. But, but I mean, that's what, that, that is what we do in the joint staff. That's, that's, our, that's our value added, is, it, is giving those people that decision space. This is something we've obviously, you know, we, this is a contingency we plan for years and years and years, going back decades. Uh, I will tell you this, I remember when I was a major at Marine Command and Staff College in 1992, they brought in the uh, USFK commander, who's a four-star, and was just impressive as hell, I thought. And he said, hey, this Korea problem's going to be over in three years. We're at a point of maximum crisis. So anytime I think about Korea, I remember 1993 and what that guy said, okay? <laughs> just saying, okay? So uh, that's about all I can say on that. Question? 
Sir, we have enough time for uh, one more question and then uh, probably closing remark. Sir. Sir, Bob Halverson, uh, Seminar 7. Sir, I heard global integration for a while now. Um, and whenever I hear global integration, I look for a global integrator, um, somebody who does that. Uh, I assume in the past that if we were to say global integration, maybe it happened with those na national strategy documents. And that's where it came from. But nobody actually, I assume, integrated it. Um, since the chairman is just an advisor, um, I assume it has to be at the OSD. I, I haven't heard anybody talk about the global integrator, the headquarters staff, the commander that's actually going to fulfill that function. Uh, maybe it's in the MS, M, N, I haven't read the NMS yet, so if you could enlighten us who that person is. That person is the chairman. The global integrator is the chairman. And let me just very, very briefly make a distinction between, so global integration is planning and advice. And we also have another term that's in, in the NMS called uh, coordinating authority. So the two terms that are in there, and I just didn't throw them out to you because I didn't want to give you a bunch of jargon, global integrator and global integration is a function per, executed by the joint staff for the Secretary of Defense and the combatant commands. For each one of the problem sets that I've described, there is a con coordinating authority. That is a COCOM. And that's a COCOM's responsibility to align global activities against that problem set. It's not a command function. Supporting supported is a command function, which is completely different than the things I'm describing here. Coordinating authority, global integration, global integrator are planning functions. Command functions are unique, different, inalienable, and emanate from the Secretary of Defense to the combatant commanders. I'm glad you actually asked that question. You should read the NMS, certainly. But, uh, but, <laughs> but, but, that's, but the global integrator, when I say global integrator, it's the chairman. And that's not a command function. That's nothing new. Uh, it's, it doesn't require any new authority for him to exercise that because it's a planning function. It is not a command function. And that's actually a very good uh, uh, question to end on. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm on time. I'm on time. Note. Um, it's great to get out here. I, uh, I really enjoyed just having a conversation with you. Like I said, I really do like taking questions. I think it's the most, that's the most effective way to do these things. It was a lot of fun for me. I hope you got something uh, from it as well. I hope to see several of you in the joint staff this summer. And uh, come on in, the water's fine. Not just because I'm, I'm gonna drive straight back to DC and work for three more hours either. But, uh, but uh, enjoy your time here. I know it's almost over. This is the first time in my life I've ever been to Carlisle, strange. But, uh, but it's a beautiful place. I know you've, you've had a great family and, and social and educational experience while you've been here. And uh, we look forward to getting you back to work. Thanks. <laughs>